Good evening and welcome to Business Today. This is the program where we talk to you about business, entrepreneurship and much more. So if you've been following this show, you would know that we talk to high profile individuals and uh, you can't really miss out on the discussions that we have on this program. And today, just uh, like any other day, we have with us an individual who is ready to share his knowledge and insight. This is Business Today. Today we have with us a personality from the company UserBase. It is a Japanese intelligence research company and uh, we have with us uh, an individual, a researcher, who is ready to share his knowledge and insight. So let's take a look at today's personality. Supun is an associate director at UserBase, a Japanese business intelligence company operating in Sri Lanka. Supun has close to 10 years of experience in providing research for international financial markets. At UserBase, Supun leads the sustainability vertical, providing research on next generation climate technologies for the innovation arms of several multinational corporations and venture capital firms. Prior to joining UserBase, Supun was an equity analyst covering e-commerce and fintech sectors, producing investment theses for some of the top Asian and global asset managers. Supun is a graduate of the University of Colombo, specializing in finance. He has also completed SIMA and was a Sri Lankan prize winner for enterprise strategy in May 2014 examinations while ranking among the top 10 in the world. He is currently reading for a master's degree in economics. Supun has represented Sri Lanka on several occasions, including the Asia-Pacific Region Finals of the CFA Institute Research Challenge in Chicago 2016 and the HSBC HKU Asia-Pacific Business Case Study Competition in Hong Kong 2015. We have with us today Mr. Supun Walpula. Thank you so much for being with us today. Good evening to you. Good evening, Prashant. Thanks a lot for having me. All right. Now, to start off uh, the question, what exactly is UserBase? Now, we know it is a Japanese intelligence, business intelligence company, but what exactly do you do? So, as you correctly said, so we are based in Japan, our parent company, and we've been there in business for like good 10, 15 years. So, what we basically do is we help our clients who are also business organizations to uh, make better decisions. How we do this is through uh, research, uh, insights, uh, consultancy work, data statistics. It's a mix of all that. But at the end of the day, what we do is, you know, we help them make uh, better strategic decisions. I will give you a couple of examples. Um, so it's like um, if you are a business who is venturing into a new um, new arm, new investment, or if you simply want to keep track of your competitors, uh, those are the type of solutions uh, that we provide for our clients. And the Sri Lankan office uh, we started in 2016. Uh, that was basically, you know, our research or uh, product in Japan is offered in the local language. When we sort of ventured into some of the other markets like the Singapore, uh, China, and most recently uh, to the US as well. We sort of wanted to create a research arm that could provide the service in English language as well. So that's why we started our Sri Lankan office in 2016. And now it has grown from uh, like a seven members when we started to around 90 members right now. So that's what in a nutshell we do globally and in the Sri Lankan context as well. All right. Now, w as you, uh, you're a researcher in this company and you've been providing research how did you enter this field of work? Because uh, now when you say you want to enter the field of research, how did you uh, come about it? Okay, so I think from a relatively young age, I sort of wanted to get into the field of uh, say business consultancy, management consultancy, like on. Um, but uh, so research was my stepping stone into something bigger. But uh, to be honest, I mean, I didn't know that research existed as a profession of up until you know I was doing my bachelor's at the University of Colombo where we got to participate in this um, uh, competition called the CFA research challenge which is like a more amateur competition for equity analysts so we were actually the Sri Lankan winners in that year and after that uh, that's where I actually got the flavor of research and after that what happened like most of the team members in our team were kind of 
picked by these financial markets uh, and the companies are doing it. That's how I actually entered into uh, research and I've been there for like, you know, close to seven, eight years now in the field. All right. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic, when you say those words, uh, we know that a lot of companies and uh, a lot of corporations worldwide have been affected by this uh, crisis. Now, being a p uh, having a parent company in a country like Japan, which is a well-developed company, how have you managed to uh, handle this pandemic? Has it been different in um, the Japan and Sri Lanka? Or have they been uh, kind of linking with the, with the Sri Lankan uh, company to battle the pandemic? Yeah, so I think um, so the general impact uh, of pandemic towards our kind of business or our line of business is quite uh, moderate because what happens is when there are problems is when clients come to us, right? So we can obviously provide solutions for them. So business wise from a demand side of things, things have been generally okay for us. And even here, like uh, in terms of our operations, um, so we've been encouraging our employees to actually work from home on and off. So when we had to do that full time, it wasn't really difficult for us to, you know, get into a full time remote working kind of an environment. So it was just a matter of having certain uh, sorting out certain um, set of, you know, guidelines or certain systems. But we were able to do that relatively quickly. And as a company, what we did was uh, when the whole pandemic started, we gave an allowance for our employees as well to, you know, buy a desk at home, buy a good chair, buy a UPA so that their productivity won't get affected as well. And even to this state, we're actually, you know, giving them an allowance for their Wi-Fi as well. So we've taken those initiatives as a company to make sure that the business runs amidst all this pandemic. So operations wise, I would actually say the impact has actually been zero. The thing is like, you know, we've been doing this for like good two, three years now. Uh, we are going to, you know, we are kind of concerned about the employee morale as well, you know, because you are just working from home. And then it's very difficult to keep the work-life balance as well when you're kind of, you know, working around the clock. So now we're actually trying to get people back to office now that the COVID is kind of subsiding. Um, so impact-wise, it was uh, none. But then now we have different problems in, you know, getting people uh, back to office, yes. Yeah, I know what that feels like. Staying at home for a long time and coming back to work is a bit of a challenge. Now, when I uh, I want to touch a bit about um, the greener environment um, standpoint. Now, a lot of people worldwide and a lot of companies are moving towards a greener solution or an eco-friendly solution. And we can see Sri Lanka, we can see a lot of youth engaging in this greener environment uh, initiative as well. And how important do you think it is for us to move towards a green environment and uh, how bad is the threat of climate change nowadays okay I, th I think actually I can answer that in just two words it's pretty bad out there right so that's why we need to act right now so how we measure the whole climate uh, change is through global warming so how global warming happens is you know we have our emissions going up to the air it depletes the ozone layer then the sunlight directly comes to here and you know it warms the environment up so that's the basic fundamental so how we measure this against is uh, we compare the current average world temperature versus what's there in 1900 pre-industrial era so right now at this moment we've seen an increase of around 1.5 degrees celsius so 1.5 degrees you might think you know it's not a big deal uh, but what happens is if we let this go at, at this trend uh, past uh, at the current rate what they're saying is by the end of this century, that means post-2050, um, it'll increase to around 3%, like 3 degrees Celsius. So at 3 degrees Celsius, what happens is your glaciers would start to melt. And then that would increase your sea level. So basically, the entire civilization would drown. So that's how bad it is if we let it run at the current level. right? So what we're doing right now, all these climate initiatives, is to basically keep the temperature rise at 1.5 degrees. Uh, it's a t challenging task. So what we are supposed to do to achieve that is one thing. By 2030, you need to half uh, like whatever the emissions that we are, uh, you know, putting out to the environment. Right? Basically, a reduction of 50% by 2030 and 100% by 2050 to just to keep it at 1.5. So these must be, you know, you know, these are aggressive targets. But that's we are aiming that essentially to prevent us from going for that from that 1.5 to three degrees Celsius, because at three degrees, it's going to be catastrophic. We might not be able to achieve these climate targets by 2050, but at least somewhere, if we can get in between, that will extend the time that we have 
for the ultimate catastrophic event. Right. Now, when you said uh, there's a degree of so one, 1 degree Celsius right now, right? 1.5. 1.5, all right. So now our main goal now is to not let this rise above that. But is there a way that we can bring it down to the level that it was before, before the industrial era? Is there a way that uh, we can do this? Yes. Uh, so uh, the thing is, you know, uh, like halving our emissions by 2030 or reducing it completely by 2050, you, can't, you might not be able to do that completely with uh, reducing so you know, not putting out new emissions to the environment you need to find a way to bring what's there in the or the carbon that's already there to bring down uh, that as well so the so the basic solution for that is actually plant increase because that's what the trees do but now what uh, all these uh, companies are doing is uh, if uh, like we're trying to figure out whether we could improve the performance of trees you know for that we are looking at genetically modified trees and all of that and there are artificial processes as well called carbon capture so we, we call this DAC or direct air capture where you can capture carbon dioxide from the environment and remove uh, like release oxygen while you know keeping that carbon uh, to yourself or you can produce some of the other products as well like uh, you know uh, biofuels or like even um, ethanol and stuff like you, know, you can produce those stuff so that's one way of doing it carbon capture but again these are still experimental solutions and it will take time for them to be developed in the future but there are definitely ways to bring whatever the carbon that's out there right now down to the pre maybe not to the pre-industrial level but to a certain extent that's manageable Great. Now, you are a big believer in renewable sources of energy. Now, we know there are a few sources uh, of renewable energy. Are there any other sources that we haven't really tapped into, but uh, you are uh, starting to find new sources? Are there any uh, um, new sources like that? Yeah. So currently, when you say renewable, it is like solar, wind and hydro in the Sri Lankan context as well. Yeah. Uh, something that's popular in the US um, and the other Western markets and towards Russian side as well is the nuclear power which is not 100% uh, uh, does not fall into the uh, definition of renewable energy because you need uranium to again uh, develop uh, nuclear power new uh, uranium is not something um, that's readily available it's a scarce resource so that wouldn't fall into the bracket of renewable energy but then that's an option there as well at least in the uh, medium term the problem with solar and wind is that um, so you don't get sunlight all the time so in Sri Lanka you do but then if you are like you know away from the equator if you have prolonged winters and also you don't get uh, sunlight for a significant period of time maybe like two three months as well so when that happens it becomes really sa same with uh, uh, wind as well because if it's a winter the windmill can't operate as well so you need some other kind of a strong solution that might not get affected by these weather conditions essentially and that's where the western markets are currently moving into uh, i can name a few uh, technologies so one thing is uh, there's something called geothermal where we try to drill into the earth and get the heat that's in the core of the earth up and to use utilize that heat and then you have uh, things like ocean power where you get the ocean current you're trying to use that kinetic energy in the ocean waves uh, to uh, generate electricity okay. uh, that's like those are two options but again like you know these are these are proven technologies but uh, at a very uh, nascent stage right now so it will take time um, so so for solar and wind to come to this level it took around 20 to 15 years so we are expecting these technologies also to come into the market probably 20 30 years into the future one other very interesting technology that uh, world is moving towards is called fusion which is uh, essentially how the sun produces its energy so for example if i clap my hands that creates some sort of a heat wave like some energy right so likewise what in the sun what happens is particles move very strongly and at a massive force and heat together it releases some sort of an energy out that's how the sun develops energy and we've been trying to build some kind of a similar technology in Sri, uh, like uh, in the in the in the in the earth as well but um, you know we've not been successful for a good 50 years with that right now but there are certain developments that are happening again very futuristic but so because of that at least in the short term or the medium term we need to be content with our solar and wind portfolio and of course there are like 
next generation iterations of that as well for example currently solar and wind is developed on the land and there are you know a proposal to build it on the sea as well so offshore solar you know that way you are you are not constrained with land uh, to build these technologies so like that like, uh, and there are like um, uh, transparent solar stuff as well where you could fit into the windows and on uh, so there are next generation iterations so until those some other next generation technologies that i told uh, you know they might come to the market in the 20 30 years until that we actually content with uh, solar and wind uh, for now, now now speaking of solar energy we know that uh, there are some countries who are trying to develop an artificial sun and i believe some are successful on that front as well what are your thoughts on that uh, so that's exactly the fusion that i was talking about right uh, so th as as i said you know it has been in the talks for around 50 60 years okay. now people haven't been successful one thing is uh, one thing that's keeping us down from there is as i said to move the particles really fast you need to put some energy into it so at right now uh, the amount of energy that it consumes to you know make this reaction happens is more than what it produces so that doesn't make sense you're putting in energy you need to you know um, your output should be more than that so that's where it's going but then comp like countries and companies around the world are experimenting on this because this is one this is like a hundred percent renewable way and the amount of energy i mean you can imagine right if you're building a sun here like the amount of energy that it can create is massive so it'll it can solve all our energy problems but the problem is it's it's at a very experimental level even at this point yeah. Right. Now, we know that these countries who are trying to develop this technology, they have a lot of uh, income, a lot of capital to uh, move towards uh, an experiment or a project like this. Do you believe that Sri Lanka has uh, the capacity and the capability to build something like this, maybe not an artificial sun per se, but some sort of renewable energy like that? Uh, is it possible for us to do that here in Sri Lanka? We actually did it. Uh, earlier than most of the others with the hydro thing right so even right now if you take the sri lanka's renewable portfolio which is around 40 percent of the total electricity mix and in the u.s the actual renewable uh, energy mix is around uh, 20 percent so we are actually doing better than u.s um, in terms of renewable energy but the problem here is growing from this point because something like hydro i think i believe that we've actually exhausted all our possibilities and right now it's only mini hydro projects that are happening in sri lanka so this it's very hard to you know create a massive output from these mini hydro plants um, so that leaves us with uh, solar and wind if you want to grow from this point which is currently around 10 percent of our electricity mix but the problem with uh, solar and wind as i said earlier in sri lanka particular we being an island nation we are constrained for land so we don't have massive land areas that we could you know give out for these projects because like uh, 40 percent of our land is agriculture and 30 percent is uh, forests so you can't ask people to not to consume food just to build uh, renewable energy so that's not a practical decision so where we could head possibly is through this home solar or like rooftop solar where you install smaller solar projects maybe you know at, at different locations ideally at every home if possible but there are uh, constraints that's keeping down that as well it's mostly on the cost front because even right now if you sort of reach out to a solar insta installation company and say i want to you know have this uh, home solar thing going on the first thing they would ask is you know what's the uh, what's our general electricity cost so they don't recommend you installing a solar unit if it you know if the investment exceeds your current electricity cost so i guess that's the thinking that we need to kind of come out of because right now I think this uh, threshold is at around 5,000 but how many households in Sri Lanka has an electricity bill of more than 5,000 so it's keeping this home solar from growing but essentially that's our best pathway at improving our like renewable portfolio which is currently at around 40 percent and the target is to reach 70 percent by 2030 it's a pretty aggressive target but a one way of doing that and i feel the most feasible way of doing it is through home solar um, so from the government side also like there are subsidies i uh, like there we are giving concessionary loans and stuff for uh, the installation of these uh, solar units but again the problem is you know loans won't uh, solve the issue with that cost uh, cost gap so ideally what we need to look at is probably if we could subsidize that cost to bring down the gap between the current electricity cost and the investment that's needed for solar if we can come up with a solution like that i think that's be pretty effective but to answer your question like future is home solar because we are kind of constrained with uh, 
the land to build our solar and wind uh, portfolio as a, as a massive scale projects. I'm not saying we can't, we should, uh, but then like, it's not a very sustainable and a feasible solution for a country like us. Right. And uh, another approach to battle this um, uh, environmental crisis is electric vehicles. Now we see there are a lot of uh, companies manufacturing these electric vehicles, some being more dominant than the other. Do you believe that electric vehicles will be the future of travel, especially here in Sri Lanka? Um, so it's not a question really. It's a question we have to make it happen, All right. right? Because you know, at the way th I, I explained you the you know catastrophic situations that we could come uh, come out of this if you if you are not properly managing it. So electric vehicles, uh, like see, transportation is one of the biggest polluters right now because simply we don't have an alternative to gasoline. Right now, the best alternative we have is electric vehicles. There has been talks about hydrogen and all like you know but then right now uh, we've invested a lot in uh, electric vehicles and we've, ex we've been experimenting with the technology for a good decade or so now so i think the ideal way like you know as i said it, it needs to happen and it needs to happen through electric vehicles there are challenges that come with it still for example you know if we flood the market with electric vehicles and if we are producing electricity from um, like you know gasoline or coal that wouldn't make sense as well that will like worsen our problem so what needs to happen is first you look at you know try to increase your renewable portfolio uh, you know develop electricity using these renewable sources and then try to you know flood the market with maybe electric vehicles the other problem with electric vehicles is again the the range that all the mileage it has with you know with it's not very really suitable for long distance transportation again to counter that you need to build charging stations everywhere so that needs to happen one of the solutions that we are looking at is right now is to improve the battery itself so that the amount of time that it takes to charge the battery comes down drastically currently it's around 30 minutes uh, but there are being there are talks about technologies that could reduce this to around like five to ten minutes so that it'll be the same time as you pump fuel to your car so basically like a fast charging fast option. charging All batteries right. yes so those are like options that the world is looking uh, at so i think you know even right now even in the more mature markets like china or us or, or even in europe like you know the out of your new auto sales it's only five percent that's electric so I mean, in Sri Lanka, it must be less than one percent, right? So it's a big challenge that lies ahead of us. But it's a doable thing because, uh, for example, costs of electric vehicles have come down significantly over the past ten years. If you say, okay, the battery cost alone has come down around eighty to ninety percent, so that that makes it possible for us to build um, like br like cars that are affordable, electric cars that are affordable. Because if you actually look at the electric car, uh, like the cost of maintenance is actually lower than uh, maintaining a gasoline vehicles because you know you don't have to pump fuel uh, you don't have to you know do services regularly no oil changes and all of that so because of that actually it's owning an electric vehicle is quite um, like cheaper than owning a gasoline vehicles is that initial cost that's higher uh, but with the battery cost coming down with the technology improving we're expecting that to come down as well and then from uh, the automakers point of view they are also kind of understood that this is where the growth is as well and they're trying to focusing more i think toyota has said that okay uh, they are like you know from 2030 onwards they are not going to produce any gasoline vehicles we don't know how realistic is this but then at least there are talks about it so that's encouraging so that's where the market is heading so i think pretty soon um, from like maybe 2030 to 2050 we could see an electric vehicle boom so to a question, it can actually dominate trans future of transportation in the world. Yes. So basically the question is not will, it's uh, when. It when, yeah. and it has to at some yeah. point. Earlier the better, actually. All right. yeah. Okay, thank you so much for giving us insight uh, with regards to renewable energy and uh, some of the new sources that we can tap into. And with that, it's time for us to wind today's program. This was Business Today. Do join us next time as well. For us. But something that now we are considering...